Hello, this is Pastor Goodman, and I'm thankful that you are joining me today for the third session on our trip through the book of Romans on a sort of a verse-by-verse exposition. We're coming to chapter 1, verses 18 to 32 today, and I'm still sort of trying to figure out the best way to do these uh, sort of video Bible studies. You know, I don't have a prompter out here somewhere that I can look at, and I've got lots of notes, and so I hate to look away from the camera and make it look like I'm reading something, but, you know, there's a lot of things I'm wanting to try to cover, and uh, fortunately, there's going to be times when I, you're going to see me looking down and reading, and I just ask that you would please bear with me. Now, before we begin this section uh, of Romans, again, cha- Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, and I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version as we go through. I just want to set some background. Uh, you know, we, we made it through the, the first 17 verses and an introduction to Romans, and, and we need to understand that when we look at the Bible and think about the Bible, that the Bible clearly presents God as the, as the measure of, of everything that's right. In other words, he's the standard that, that by which things are measured. It's not what we want. It's not what we think could be right, but rather we have to understand that it's what God says that's right and what God says is wrong is wrong. And so uh, when we look at the scripture in that way, we, we begin to understand that we as humans are the main cause of the problems in this world, suffering and evil because we tend to rebel against God and bring a lot of this stuff on ourselves. If we'd listen to God and do what God wants us to do, then we wouldn't have quite as much uh, hatred, as much violence, as much rampant sin as there seems to be in the world around us today. You see, our sinful condition continues to separate us from God. And as a result, we let our sinful condition uh, take over, and the world is not the place that God would want it to be as a result of that sinful condition. Through our rebellion, as we are going to see here in just a few of the verses that we're going to look at today, through our rebellion, we produce sexual immorality, we uh, continue idolatry, we let vile passions take over our lives, and we debase our minds. The scriptures, our, our rebellion, when we look at it in terms of the scriptures, it's quite clear that we are rebelling and that our rebellion is going to have to have some consequences. And there's going to be judgment. And Paul is going to be dealing with that in other parts of Romans. Um, but today we begin with the understanding that sin is real. Sin is something that separates us from God. Sin is our rebellion from God and our decision to want to do things our way rather than God's way. And that's sort of a a background as I get into the passages for today. When we look at chapter 1, verse 18, we begin, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. When we start here, Paul starts off, the wrath of God. You know, it's not like he just pitches a little temper tantrum and goes, oh, why do they keep doing that? We're talking the wrath of God. Go to the Old Testament. Look at what it says in the Old Testament. Look at how what happened when God's wrath came down upon the nation. Paul is saying that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness, all the wickedness of those who by their wickedness seek to suppress the truth. Now, what's happening here is not just talk about wrong behavior, but instead the focus is upon the wrong patterns of thought that give rise to the behaviors. Paul is saying that we, by just our very thought patterns, are are living and producing this sin. The, the, The thoughts lead to the behavior, Paul is saying. It's not the behavior. Paul wants us to go beyond the behavior, which is wrong, and understand that it's caused by our thoughts. 
as we seek to suppress the truth. We go on then in verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Now this is a, a little hint at, at what you would call a natural religion. You know, In other words, Paul is saying if you look at the world in which we live, if you look at the mountains and the seas and the trees and the birds and all that stuff, the, the cosmos with the stars, by just looking at those things, you've got to understand somewhere in yourself that there had to be a creator, that there had to be something, someone that created these things. Now, that knowledge would point us toward a God, but it might, but it would not be knowledge that would provide salvation just by saying, yes, God, there was a God that created everything. That's not enough for salvation. But Paul is saying that the very world in which we live points us towards God. Continuing in verse 20. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that he has made. You got to know God created it. Surely you can see his power. Uh, so they are without excuse. We can't say, oh, I didn't know there was a God. Nature, the creation, the cosmos itself points us toward the fact that there has to be some being out there, some deity out there that brought all this into existence. Continuing in verse 21, For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Well, well, maybe God created something. Maybe there is a deity, but I'm not going to worry about him. I'm going to do things the way I want to do. And our minds became darkened. We shut out the light that God put into the world. And verse 22 says, claiming to be wise. I know better. I can understand it. I can logic it out. I can figure it out. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God, the glory of the God that created heavens and the earth, the glory of the God that spoke and brought into being everything that was. They exchanged all that for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. In other words, they created an idol. They engaged in idolatry. And in, through their engaging in idolatry, they basically confirmed that they believed more in what they saw, more in what they could figure out, than they did in the God that created all these things. I will make my own God, is what Paul is saying humanity has done. By just simply ignoring the 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 fact that on its face alone we have to understand that this world came from somewhere that it wasn't just an accident but some have reason that maybe it was and instead decide to do things on their own let's see we're moving then into verse 24 and you need to understand and listen for the this phrase that's going to be repeated therefore god gave them up in the next few verses, Paul is going to use that phrase three different times. It's a general statement of what happens when idolatry takes over in our lives. God, it says in verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, what Paul seems to be hinting at here is the pagan uh, uh, worship culture. Uh, you see, when you worshipped many of these pagan gods, it would involve sexual intercourse. 
you would go to the temple and you would find a temple prostitute and you would engage in sex with this temple prostitute so that in that act of sexual union it was considered worship. Well, by doing that, you are denying worship that should be given to who? That should be given to God. And so you're exchanging the truth about God, Paul says, for a lie. And you're worshiping and serving the creature rather than God himself. And so that causes a few problems. Then we move on to verse 26. And we hear these words again. For this reason, God gave them up. You know, God is giving up. God is going to, God just gave up and said, okay, we'll just see where you all head. We'll just see what you all end up doing. Well, since you think you know it all anyway, let's see what happens. Therefore, for this reason, God gave them up, verse 26, to their degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Now you know I'm going to have to stop here and try to, to really present an argument because the world says that what's going on in this verse why, is wrong. The world says you've got it all wrong. The scriptures make it clear that homosexual relations between women and women, men and men, is something that is not God's intended plan. Uh, you see, God gave them up to their degrading passions. That's a specific comment as to what happens when we as humans fail to adhere to the gender roles of male and female as God originally had created us. You know, our original passions were for a man and a woman to unite, not for a woman and woman or for a man and man to unite. And so this is a very direct reference on Paul's part to homosexual practices, both uh, male and female. You see, Paul, he could have chosen a lot of the pagan vices to highlight his point. Uh, you see, Jews regarded homosexual practice uh, as a classic example of, of one of the pagan vices. Uh, again, sometimes it was uh, just seen as that's what the pagans do. That's the things that they engage in. But we as Yahweh's people do not engage in these kinds of things. Uh, Paul may be looking at the world in, in view of Genesis 1, some have suggested, in which male and female uh, were created and, and simply by looking at the way that God created them in, in God's own image he created them male and female you know when you think about the, the way that the male and the female are created it's pretty clear that sexual intercourse was designed for a male and a female to complement each other and for procreation to occur you know, that seems to be pretty clearly the original plan that God had in Genesis. And Paul is hearkening back to that, saying that we, once again, are being rebellious. We are saying, well, that may have been God's plan, but that is not what God's plan for me is. That is not what God's plan for the world is today. And you can see how these things go on. You know, his point is that Homosexual practice, I think, is a distortion of what God's original created design for human beings was. And such practices, Paul says, are evidence uh, not of the intention of individuals to engage in those practices for their own sake. Paul goes deeper, but he says that they are the result of the tendency that we as humans have to want to do things our own way. And so it, it's going back again. It's not just the act itself that, that is wrong. Our very intent, the very reason we think the act is right, is wrong according to Paul. He's going back to that, that, that deep understanding that it's not just the act which is wrong. All sin is wrong. The actions of all sin are wrong. 
but rather it's our rebellious nature that says we can do it our way that, that makes the act wrong. It's the nature, it's our thoughts that turn the actions into sin, and both the action and the thought are sinful. You know, Paul is saying that persons that engage, he's not saying, and this is an argument that some use, some say that since in the passage just before he was talking about cultic worship where uh, you would get involved, uh, get involved with a sexual relation with a temple prostitute, sometimes that would be homosexual, sometimes it wouldn't. Some were saying that those, these two are linked together, that passage before and this. Most scholars don't say that they're linked together. They see a distinct difference with the first passage dealing with idolatry and this passage dealing specifically with the degrading passions that we have because of our continued rebellion against God. He, he's saying that persons who engage in homosexual actions, they're not worshiping idols. That's not what's going on here. That's not what he's referring to. But instead, he's arguing that the existence of homosexual practice itself is a sign that the culture as a whole is worshiping false idols and that the God-given male-female order is fractured as a result of the rebellion of the entire culture in which we live. You see, he sees homosexual practice as a dangerous distortion of what God's original intentions were of male and female coming together. You know, if you exchange the true God for an image or an idol, you're, you're going to be living a distorted life. And if you exchange your created humanness for your creature's desires, then you're going to live a life in which you again, put yourself and what you think is right ahead of what God has declared to be right or wrong. And so, when it comes to this issue of, of homosexual practice, we as United Methodists, and I'm going to get off here a little bit on, on doctrine now rather than straight scripture, the United Methodist Church declares that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. We believe that Christian teaching, the, the Bible, the, the church through the centuries has said that homosexual practice is not something to engage in. And I believe that one of the, the past, this passage from Paul is part of the reason we say that. It's also part of the reason that others take it and interpret it another way. But the church has declared that homosexual practice is incompatible with Christian teaching. We further declared that self-avowed practicing homosexuals cannot be ordained as an elder or as a deacon. They cannot serve local churches. We've also said that local churches cannot be used uh, to celebrate uh, homosexual unions, whether you call it marriage or civil ceremony, whatever term you want to use. That's changing as, as the laws change. We've made it clear that churches, United Methodist churches, cannot be used for those kinds of ceremonies. And so we find ourselves as a church at odds with the society in which we live. Because society more and more is saying that these kinds of practices are acceptable because God created us. God loved us. Yes, God created us. God created us with an intent that male and female should come together and form a union. And we have chosen to ignore what God created us as, as a society, and say that there are other ways that it can be done. And so... That's one of the chief reasons that homosexual practice is incompatible with Christian teaching. Now, I've probably made some of you go, yes, thank you for saying that, and others go, look at what a bigot he is. I'm sorry. It's the scripture. It's the teaching of the church. It's what I vow as a United Methodist minister to uphold, and that's simply the way that it is. You can either agree with me or disagree with me, but that's sort of the, the, the way that it's interpreted. Moving on. Uh, let's see. Verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and two things that should not be done. 
They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Wow. You know, uh, this is a... God gave them up, it says, to a debased mind and to things that should not have been done. And then Paul goes on to uh, list a, a long but not exhaustive uh, litany of the sins that we in our humanness, in our debased nature, in our uh, desire to see and do things in our own way, these are the actions that come about. You see, Paul views sin not as the arbitrary breaking of, of a simple divine rule, but rather it's a behavior that's unfitting for us as humans to perform. Because in performing, in engaging in sin, we are saying again, going back to the basic here of what this passage is about, that we know better than the Creator that we know better than God the right things to do and the wrong things to do. Paul says, look what happens. God has given you up to let you try it your way, and this is a result. And he lists these various things on and on. You see, it wasn't uh, meant to be a, a ranking of the vices. Uh, you know, none of these are necessarily worse than the other. One sin is just as bad as any other sin. Paul was instead trying to paint a picture. He was trying to, to paint a broad, rich portrait full of color of what we as humans have done because we think we know how to do it. Look at that list. Envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, gossip, slander, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, and it goes on and on and on. That's what we've come up with. That's not what God intended. And so there Paul is seeking to remind us that as we continue to stray, as we continue to let sin have its course, we are continuing to develop more and more. If he were to go into a modern day, just think of the things you could list and add to that list. And so Paul's trying to make it clear. If you don't follow God, if you don't do what God is saying, God is going to give you up. And this is what you're going to come up with. And then finally, verse 32. They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. And yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Go back to the very beginning. What was that very first verse there in chapter uh, one for the wrath uh, chapter one verse eighteen for the wrath of God is revealed. Do you want to know what the wrath is? Here's how it ties it up in verse thirty two. They know God's decree. Looking at the world, we should know that a Creator made us. We should know that there is a God. God has made Himself clear through Jesus Christ that He is the God, and he, God has laid down His rules for living for us, and we continue to disobey and break those rules. We continue to practice those kinds of things, and God's wrath is we deserve to die for that. But not only do we just continue to practice them and continue to, to bring about our own spiritual death, but we even applaud others that practice them. Do I need to make myself any clearer? Pick your sin. There are those that are going to be saying, yay, it's okay for that person or that group to engage in that. It's okay for them to do this. It's okay for this. And we say, yay, good job. You're doing great. Keep up the good work. That's not right. That's not what God is trying to, to, to convey to us. God has a plan. God's plan uh, lays down some guidelines. We disobey those guidelines. We sin. And when we sin, we bring God's wrath upon us, which ultimately leads to spiritual death. 
Now, as we work our way through Romans, we're going to see the way out of this spiritual death. But as it stands right now, at this stage in the letter, we are facing death because of our continued disobedience and rebellion to God. Well, I hope that you have found uh, this passage interesting. Uh, Come back next Thursday. And join with me as I begin in chapter 2. Don't know how far I'll get in chapter 2, but I'll uh, try to get at least halfway through the chapter. Uh, So write some comments at the bottom. I'm sure I might get a few comments from this one. Uh, Those both in favor and those against some of the things that I said. But I encourage you, listen to these videos, leave comments, I'll respond to them. And we will create a dialogue as we study uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. God bless. Have a good day. And I hope to see you in church on Sunday.